Wonderful. So good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, here at the uh, event around the water conference at UN this week. Um, this is a side event about, by the Small Grants Program, the GF Small Grants Program implemented by UNDP. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Yoko Watanabe. I'm the Global Manager of the GF Small Grants Program implemented by UNDP. Uh, we're delighted to have this event together with you. Um, we have chosen this format of Zoom format where people can see each other and uh, communicate each other. So hope uh, we can utilize this platform well today. So just to give you a little bit of housekeeping to start with, um, please keep your microphone muted during the presentation. Uh, we will have ample time for questions, comments, and feedback, a dialogue later in the presentation. So we really appreciate uh, your active participation then. Meanwhile, please mute it and uh, please feel free to use the chat box to comment on anything and uh, feel free to say hello to all participants and speakers here. Second of all, this session is recorded. So we should be able to um, use the recording and uh, distribute as people who are not able to participate as there are many competing and also very rich uh, uh, schedule going on with the water conference. So this will be recorded unless there is any major objection to the notion. Thank you very much in advance. So first of all, the objective of the session here today is to really showcase good practices and lessons learned at the community level on water management and really to see how best we can replicate these best practices and scale up these at the policy and program levels and also inform other communities and other countries how we can utilize these uh, good partnership with government, private sectors and others. And we will be highlighting particularly partnership initiatives uh, influencing community-led efforts towards enhancing water quality and improve access to safe water and sanitation. And we'll use this opportunity to share lessons and try to see what we can do further through the Small Grants Program as well as partnership with others. And we hope that this dialogue will contribute to a particular theme of the water conference, which is on water, climate, water for climate resilience and environment, which is source to sea biodiversity, climate resilience and uh, disaster risk reduction. So we really want to directly contribute this from the community end. And as you may know, the Small Grants Program is celebrating the 30th anniversary this past year we have been in existence since 1992. International waters and water issue is a very important part of our initiative. Uh, we work on biodiversity, climate change, land degradation, chemicals and waste and other issues. But this is one of the key elements where we are working cross-border uh, transboundary initiative and further on both ocean and freshwater issues. Uh, we have invested over close to $5 million in 127 countries that we operate. So this is a great opportunity around the water conference that we are able to highlight the work, particularly this time in the small island development states, focusing on the Caribbean islands. So welcome all the speakers today. We will have uh, opening remarks and then uh, four distinguished speakers uh, who will be highlighting on different elements within the Caribbean uh, since, uh, states. So with no further ado, I have a pleasure of introducing my colleague, Ms. Ana Maria Nunez, a regional technical specialist at UNDP. She focuses on water, oceans, and ecosystem and biodiversity at United Nations Development Program. She has been a key partner working with IWECO and many other initiatives with Small Grants Program and championing on the international waters portfolio uh, within our program. And she has really rich experiences over 16 years designing and implementing and overseeing projects around the world 
Um, and it's a real pleasure to have Ana Maria here as our key champion. So over to you, Ana Maria, for the op opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dike Yoko, and also to the NTP team for inviting me today for giving the opening remarks. Uh, it is really my pleasure. Well, uh, along with the realization of basic human rights, achieving fair lending, water, and sanitation services is the main target of the sustainable development of the states, which states ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. It is also well known that the SDG 6 is connected to the other goals, with many stakeholders arguing that the SDG 6 is the center of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Despite the critical role of water and sanitation, hundreds of thousands of people lack access to these basic needs. The largest available evidence from the World Health Organization shows that annually some 879,000 people in low and middle income countries die because of inadequate water sanitation and hygiene. This has been attributed to weak institutions, mm. poor governing systems, and increased water pollution. In the Caribbean, access to safe water and sanitation is still a major concern despite the abundance of water resources within the region. A large part of this problem is due to human activities. For instance, plastics contribute significantly to water pollution in the Caribbean, with the number of floating microplastics and macroplastics estimated to be around 82,000 and 5,000 pieces per square kilometer, respectively. Ensuring availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all requires a collective effort at various scales. Yet, at the local level, many institutions are generally weak and underfinanced. This impedes the efforts of local actors and community groups. Recognizing the key role of local action, the United Nations Development Program, through its Nature, Climate, Energy, and Waste Team, provides financial and technical support to local actors. Since 1992, the Global Environment Facility, a small grant program, has been implemented by UNDP, which is committed to significantly expanding the size and scope of its support to local actors. It is undeniable fact that we cannot solve community problems without the active participation and contribution of local people and institutions. Therefore, UNDP through the NCE W team works closely with community groups and various local actors to addressing critical water and sanitation problems. In the past five, sorry, in the past five years, NGP has provided financial and technical support to civil society and non-governmental organizations to implement about 150 innovative community-based water focus initiatives with a grant amount of around 4.7 million US dollars and a co-financing of, of, of almost the same uh, in amount. The success of SGP's initiatives is due to strong partnership with a wide range of actors, the co-creation of solutions and the leveraging of local knowledge and resources to address community problems. I really believe that the UN 2023 Water Conference is an opportunity for all of us to reflect on our successes, failures, lessons, and what we can do collectively to achieve a human sustainable development and face the triple planetary crisis. Therefore, I would like to thank the NGP team for bringing us together in this important event for reflections, learning, and sharing. To all of you also who have joined this session, thank you for making time to join this side event. Though the topic of the base of this event is focused on the Caribbean, there might be insights for stakeholders from other regions, particularly uh, to the small island developing states. Therefore, I encourage all of us to be fully engaged in this session today. Thank you so much, Jill, and stay participants.
Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ana Maria. Thank you so much for being our close friend and champion for Small Grants Program and really advancing the work of the international waters, particularly working in the Caribbean um, and other places together and uh, bringing in a really important sort of uh, angle on how it is important to working with local communities on water management and sanitation and safe water um, harvesting. So thank you so much for that. Um, with that, uh, we are really uh, delighted and excited to move forward to the panel discussion. We will have four um, speakers. I mean, I mean, it's it's more speakers than four, actually, but for full countries. Uh, we will be hearing from Jamaica and Antigua and Barbuda, as well as St. Lucia and Trinidad Tobago today. And we will be hearing from uh, Reach to Reef Initiative to water quality monitoring to many different angles of community engaging in ensuring water supply and sanitation matters. So with no further ado, the first presenter is from Ms. Abigail Richards, who will be presenting on building local capacity for water quality monitoring and improved sanitation in Jamaica. And Abigail will also share a video on the replication results. Um, Ms. Abigail Richards is the scientific officer at the UWI Discovery Bay Marine Laboratory. And she has over six years of experience in, in co-leading and leading marine and coast, coastal coral reef monitoring projects and working alongside the Jamaica Sanctuary Network. So with no further ado, I will forward to you, Abigail, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yep, we're seeing it well. Okay. Good afternoon. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Abigail Richards. I am a scientific officer at the UA Discovery Bay Marine Lab, and today I will be briefly speaking on how we partnered with the GEF Smart Grants Program to help build local capacity for water quality monitoring in Jamaica. So we as scientists or researchers tend to identify a problem, let's say that problem being the decline in coral reefs or it being overrun with algae. And then we tend to use a scientific approach to solve those problems. And then we relay those information to stakeholders like the community members with the intention that they'll, they'll follow our recommendations, recommendations like no fishing in certain areas or proper use of fertilizer. This is not very appealing and is not normally very effective. According to Kaiser and others in their 2019 paper, they show that we will see better outcome and better improvement in marine ecosystem if we incorporated the knowledge and experience from locals from the very beginning, plus our academic approach. As unique information can be obtained from the locals about the study area and about the issues that's causing the environmental issues in the first place versus a top-down approach where we tend to use science first and then community after. With this in mind, a well-known problem in Jamaica, especially in Discovery Bay, a small embayment on the coast, north coast of Jamaica, is the drastic decline in coral reefs between the 1980s and the 1990s. And according to Terry Hughes and other researchers, this was due to a host of problems, such as natural problems like hurricanes or diseases, but also due to man-made problems, which are controllable problems, like overfishing and pollution. And other researchers went on to further link pollution to the coral reef decline. So, but no specific study has shown specific uh, pollution sites within Discovery Bay. So in 2017, the UA Discovery Bay Marine Lab partnered with the Aloha Fisherman Association partnered with the Aloha Fisherman Association and the GES Small Grants Program to evaluate the water quality of Discovery Bay. Because it doesn't make sense for us to continue our coral reef restoration projects or work if water quality continues to be a hindrance. So we partnered with four fishermen, um, three community 
three young ladies to first go out into the communities and, uh, and partake in community surveys where we try to get an understanding of uh, what the community think pollution is and how they think uh, they are a part of the pollution problem. And from the surveys, we were able to select our sample sites. We then trained three of those fishermen in open scuba water diving. And then further, we trained them in coral reef monitoring. A lot of the fishermen, being fishermen, they were able to, they were already familiar with the fishes, whether by their colloquial names, and they were also familiar with like invertebrates such as sea cucumbers. Our experience was really just needed for like the coral identification and bringing them along or bringing them along on the coral reef surveys gave them a better appreciation for what we're trying to protect in what we're trying to protect them. We also train three young ladies in water quality sampling and water quality assessment um, for like parameters like nitrates, phosphates, fecal coliform, pH, temperature, and such. And from that project, the local monitoring that being the community survey, as was mentioned before, we were able to select our sample sites. According to the community members, we should target like the dolphin pen that was in the bay, as well as road drains and the different beaches. A key result from our scientific monitoring was that there was high fecal coliform by the Fisherman Beach. And because uh, we suspect that that was due to a soak away pit that was at the beach and the high bathroom usage there. So we were able to replace that soak away pit with uh, a septic tank and further employ members from the community to help with the installation. So what was the outcome from that project. Well, we improve our relationship with the lab and community members because a lot of fishermen don't generally trust us as researchers, even here at the lab. So when they're involved from the very beginning, they see what we're doing and they see how the funds are spent and see how we're spending it within the community. We also, for the fishermen that were trained in scuba diving, they can now use that to further make money, whether it be in an other coral reef work or taking like a tourist and a dive or so. And uh, we also bought the Fisherman Cooperative uh, boat engine because their own was done. They are now able to continue patrols along uh, the Discovery Bay to further strengthen, strengthen the purpose of the fish sanctuary that is. And because of the good work that was established from that project in just this area, the Discovery Bay area, which is about 160 hectares, we further upscale that project to seven other special fishery conservation areas along the north coast of Jamaica that run in from the west of Jamaica to the east of Jamaica. Um, so we further partnered with the Jamaica Fish Sanctuary Network. We partnered with the National Conservation Trust Fund to assess the water quality in all of the fish sanctuaries on the north coast of Jamaica. That involved meeting with the different sanctuary managers, um, getting them on board, getting a community member from each community on board as well. And that involved persons of different gender, different age group, different profession. Last year, March, we, all 14 of us, went into the different communities, went into the different communities and carried out coral reef pollution surveys. And from that, again, we were able to select our sample sites. We then trained all 14 persons in water quality assessment and water quality sampling. We taught them to test for parameters like nitrates, phosphate, fecal coliform temperature, pH and so on. And then from last May to now, I can proudly say that we have done 11 months of water sampling across the entire North Coast of Jamaica around in around 50 different sample points. So this video now will give you a summary of what we did.
And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abigail, for this uh, fantastic video and your presentation, which shows the replication that, that of the amazing initiative on water quality assessment by young female uh, trained um, working on these issues. And it's, it's really amazing to see that uh, it's being replicated into seven different communities and be able to engage so many for water quality improvement and water resources supply. Thank you so much for that, Abigail, for your great presentation. And uh, now we'll go to the second presentation now from Jamaica, moving to St. Lucia. So we will be uh, welcoming uh, Mr. Cletus uh, Springer, who will be presenting about the community management and roles in coastal zone management from ridge to reef. Cletus is an urban planner, a public administrator and communication practitioner with over 30 years of experience in sustainable development policy planning and management. He has been written uh, extensively on SIDS related sustainable development matters, matters and challenges, including on water and climate issues. We're really delighted to uh, see you here, Mr. Springer. Um, over to you for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and um, good morning, everybody. Um, it's really good to be attending another World Water Forum side event, uh, this time from the comfort of my own home. Uh, first of all, uh, I should applaud the Jeff Small Grants Program for the uh, truly amazing work that it has been doing, not just across the Dusha, but across the Caribbean and indeed across the world, in, in really empowering local communities to identify and address uh, their, their own sustainable development challenges. And, and my membership on the Jeff Small Grants Council has given me a, a first-hand appreciation of the tremendous impact of the SDP on lives and livelihoods. I must also take the opportunity to commend my colleagues, uh, especially uh, Jazz Romulus, our local coordinator, and acknowledge his outstanding input, as well as his vision and his, his energy is quite amazing. And I want to thank my colleagues on the uh, council as well. Next slide, please. So today I'll be sharing with you three projects that uh, in my view demonstrate the scope and the depth of small grants uh, interventions in the water and climate domain in St. Lucia. Uh, water and climate, as you know, is a critical prism of analysis and action for sustainable development. Uh, and in my own view, there can be no sustainable, there can be no sustainable development without the sustained and focused investment of, of local and international actors in helping to build a climate resilient water sector uh, in our islands. And the three projects that I will share with you is uh, one, the establishment of the Francis Jacques Protected Landscape and Agriculture uh, Tourism Park, uh, the design of a mobile desalination facility and the creation and conversion of a community CMOS enterprise to a sustainable community national enterprise. Next slide, please. So for those of you not familiar with St. Lucia, and, and I want to suggest that the best way you can uh, uh, fix that is by visiting uh, my country. I can assure you, you won't regret it. But in the meantime, for the purposes of this presentation, I, I think you should note that uh, St. Lucia, like most countries across the, the, the Caribbean, uh, is, is volcanic in origin. It's about 616 square kilometers in area. Um, it has a, uh, uh, you know, like most of the countries as well, it has a, a central mountain range that um, drains directly into the sea. It has a very na narrow coastal zone, um, which leads us in the region to say, in Sebusha to say in particular, that uh, small island states in the Caribbean are essentially one whole coastal zone, if you want to put it that way. So everything, the watershed is in the coastal zone generally, or impacts the coastal zone. And these impacts are fairly direct and they're fairly, fairly uh, immediate. Slide, next slide, please. So this slide uh, uh, really sets out the, uh, contextualizes um, the, the threat of climate change 
and juxtaposes that with the, the watersheds in St. Lucia. And you can see from the slide um, that many, if not all of the watersheds are in areas of, of uh, a high population um, um, in, in the country, um, and which presents a challenge in and of itself. To the left of that slide, you know, we set out the, the recent um, ER6 uh, findings and conclusions about small island states and the impact of climate change on the small island states. And you will notice that um, these impacts are deemed to be uh, medium to high um, in terms of the confidence with which the, the, the IPCC has uh, laid out uh, these threats. Uh, in the context of SIDS, this, this, this really dictates that we must have a, a rich to reef approach to adaptation and mitigation. Um, and that uh, uh, because of the fact that the proximity of the land to sea interface is so, is so stark and so immediate, um, it makes SIDS like, like St. Lucia an extended coastal zone. Next slide, please. The dynamics of the water sector in St. Lucia are, are not uh, dissimilar to those of other SIDS in the Caribbean or indeed in the Pacific. Um, the fact that our water resources management is really still institutionally centralized and, and there's some fragmentation as well. Um, and, and critically, and this is where the Jeff has made a, a very important impact, is in making uh, water resources management more participatory. Um, and, and the examples that I will show in a little while will, will confirm this. In slide six, please. Next slide. Um, St. Lucia has, despite the, 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 the uh, scenario I painted in the last slide, um, there's a reasonably strong framework of policies and laws and, and institutions in integrated water resources management in the country. And much of that has been established over the past uh, two decades. And you can see from, from the slide that we have uh, our policies and strategic plans and everything from biodiversity to water to land policies and so on. Next slide. And in this slide, we, we, we depict the uh, sectoral adaptation strategies and action plans. And these were developed on the national adaptation plan. Um, and as you can see, it's most recent, it's, it's back to 2018. And you will note that there are nine priority areas um, are indicated vertically. Um, linking, of course, with the cross-cutting themes above and, and, and below. And that in, in, in some way depicts the, the, the schematic that is driving the, the concept of integrated water resources management in Singapore. Next slide, please. So I've already mentioned the three thread projects that I would, I would uh, uh, describe, and so I'll, I'll move on to the next slide. Thank you. So the first of these projects is the, the Fonce Jacques um, Protected Landscape and Agro uh, Tourism Park. Uh, this project was uh, established within an, an area that we, we, we call the Soufre Landscape Complex. And we've defined it that way because of the proximity, uh, spatial connections, high incidence of biodiversity, and the existence of a marine coastal park and a world heritage site Within these various, uh, within this site. As you can see in my background uh, picture uh, with the pitons in the background, this basically is the area that we are speaking about if you, if you go uh, really deep. It measures about 38 uh, square kilometers um, and it, it impacts, it deals with, in fact, one of the 37 watersheds, uh, main watersheds in St. Lucia. Um, and since uh, 2012, the Jeff Small Grants Program has been investing heavily in this area through, through eight projects. I, I should make that correction. Uh, I, my slide says 14 is really eight. And, and we've used a, a rich to reef approach in all of this. Next slide, please. Now you may wonder um, about the relevance of an agro-tourism park to, to watershed management. And that is a fair, uh, fair question. Um, but this is a concept that is gaining uh, currency across the world um, as a product development and integrated water resource management strategy. It seeks to marry environmental preservation and conservation with the sustainable economic use of the resource of the watershed uh, for various uses such as eco and adventure tourism, agriculture, and other uh, economic activities. Critically, however, um, it allows for the integration 
of the historic, the cultural, uh, as well as the present and future uses of the landscape on the, a, a very attractive uh, brand name. Uh, and it gives communities in, in these areas a skin in the game, as we say in, in, the, in the Caribbean. It gives them a sense of ownership of the resource, as well as it allows them to generate revenue to sustain their livelihoods, as well as to sustain the basis for these livelihoods, which is, of course, the resources on which they depend. Uh, so this, this approach is not new. Uh, next slide, please. So in the Rich to Reef approach, uh, we worked with the sustained involvement of communities in the watershed, as well as communities in the coastal zone. Um, we have a coastal zone in that area, which is defined as the Sufra Marine Management Area. And time does not permit me to give you a, a, even a cursory appreciation of the history and the impact of that, uh, of that authority, of that area. But um, it's enough for me to say that it is one that we consider to be one of the jewels in St. Lucia's crown in terms of its contribution to global knowledge uh, on, on marine conservation. And this project has focused on changing the active land use from crops, which were deemed to have a significant erosive effect on, on the landscape, as, uh, and two crops that have a more benign uh, impact, such as uh, nature, uh, uh, tourism, sorry, not crops, but activities, and land uses that have a, a more benign uh, uh, impact on the landscape. So critically, not only did this project um, develop the capacity of the community to manage the site and ensure that visitor expenditure stays in the community, uh, it also created a learning community by ensuring that monitoring and evaluation systems are well established and working effectively. And all of this has been done by the community itself with no, with no outside uh, input. Uh, and that I think is very critical. That speaks to the, to the core of the issue of ownership and co-management. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in this project, therefore, we have achieved uh, many uh, benefits. I mentioned the fact that, that the community is now empowered to do its own management, to do its own monitoring. Uh, we have trained over 40 uh, 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 members of the community in various aspects of the management of the agro-tourism park, etc. From all accounts, these inputs uh, are, are, are continue to yield sustained um, outcomes, and we're very proud of that. Next slide, please. So in this slide, we are showing the, uh, the signature of a memorandum of understanding between the government of St. Lucia, uh, and in the picture there is the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture, who is signing an MOU with uh, one of the members of the community. Um, and and this, this MOU is, is uh, how should I put it, Trans transformative in the sense that it gives to the community the authority to manage the resources uh, within the, 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 the agro-tourism park. And, and this is huge in our, in our estimation. Um, it builds on a, a, a an initiative that we took in 1993. And those of you who come to St. Lucia at my invitation and go to the Sulphur Springs, which is a, a, a caldera, a, a, a spring bath, hot spring baths in the, in the Sulphur Spring area, that facility in 1993 was transformed. The authority for management was transformed to a local organization called the Sufra Regional Development uh, Foundation. And critically, what's happening there, Collins, is that the revenue that's generated by the community in managing these, these, uh, these natural assets are, are reinvested in the development of the community. So, so Jeff Small Grants can take huge credit from this, 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 uh, 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 this initiative uh, or this, this kind of, 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 of approach. So in the next two slides, next slide, please. You can see here the, the pride, pride for the faces of the members of the Fonsage Jacques community uh, to the right and left uh, of, this, of, this, of this slide. Next slide, please. So the, the second um, project I want to quickly um, share with you is the, uh, the provision of a mobile desal plant 
um, in, in a community called in Labri. And we worked there with the Labri uh, Fisheries um, uh, community. Um, I'm sorry? Please continue. Oh. I think there yes, was I thought I heard, a, I heard a sound. Uh, so this was a four to six thousand um, dollar US um, project, but I can tell you, in terms of its impact, um, it is it is significant, and the impact is not just in Saint Lucia and in the community where this this uh, this this was done. It is also impacted as far as Nauru, in the in the Pacific, um, and this is a mobile plant that. Um, what has a design capacity, uh, was designed initially with the capacity of 1,500 uh, liters per day, um, and it has the potential for upscaling with uh, Japanese funding to 3,700 uh, liters per day. Um, so this is significant. This was initially done, as I said, for St. Lucia. Um, uh, the, the concept was, was, was uh, uh, submitted. Uh, for competition that was organized um, by the government of Nauru and, and it won. And so the people of Nauru uh, are benefiting from this um, portable uh, desalination plant. And here again, the Jeff uh, Small Grants can take huge credit for this. Next slide, please. And this is just a, a, a picture of the, of the project team um, at the point where the, the uh, the plant was being shipped to Nairobi. Uh, next slide, please. So the final project I wanted to share with you was a project, it's a project called the CMOS um, project. I, 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 I described it as converting a local community enterprise into a national community enterprise. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the CMOS, um, with CMOS as a, 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 a beverage uh, and its widespread use across the islands. Um, in, in, in SIDS. Um, but here we worked with a, with a community in the coastal zone um, in, 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 uh, in St. Lucia. And um, what has happened is quite, has been quite dramatic. The income of the CMOS farmers in that community has increased by over 500%. And critically, that community is now fully seized of the need to protect and, and conserve the, uh, you know, manage the, the, the resource in the coastal zone in that area in a, in a sustainable manner. And, and, and I, again, I emphasize that this is the best way to go. Um, you have to give people an incentive to protect the resource. And if their, their livelihoods is tied to, to that resource, then, then they can better appreciate the need to keep, it, keep the resource in top shape. So to conclude, um, so what are the key lessons um, and recommendations that we have coming out of this, this uh, our projects? First of all, we, we, we are convinced that the small grants um, methodology or modality is ideal, is the ideal vehicle for promoting collaborative water resources management in SIDS. Um, similarly, we believe that a rich to reef approach in the context of SIDS should be fully endorsed by the GEF um, as being best suited to the size and spatial dynamics and characteristics of SIDS. Thirdly, we believe enhancing and sustaining the livelihoods of communities is integral to promoting collaborative management of natural resources, not just water resources, but all natural resources. Um, fourthly, we believe that the GEF Small Grants Policy and Operational Guidelines should recognize the inherent challenges of working with low capacity communities, but communities at the same time that have high interest in, in bettering their lives and bettering the environment. And the point I'm trying to make here, we're trying to make here is that um, more resources should go in, in, in pre-appraisal or capacity enhancement, um, and more time should be given in the project cycle to enable these, these uh, communities to, to come to grips with the project. Um, um, we, we, we tend to find that we are under a lot of pressure to deliver on these projects, but we recognize at the same time, based on the baseline 
the capacity baseline of these communities that we need to invest in building that capacity at the same time. So uh, this is one recommendation that we want to make very strongly. And semi-finally, we believe that a focus on the land, water, and energy and nexus in, in IWRM is, um, is needed in the context of SIDS. And finally, we believe very strongly that indigenous research and innovation should be encouraged across all SIDS. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Cletus, for this really comprehensive presentation and really emphasizing on the integrated approach and also ownership from the community and showing such an innovation from agro tourism park to desalinization machine to the CMOS project. And I really see that uh, how St. Lucia has not only in the country have evolved in supporting local communities, but now towards Nauru and to Pacific and sharing that South-South cooperation happening. Then thank you so much for bringing that really integrated approach in, in St. Lucia. Really appreciate. With that, uh, we're really delighted to now move towards uh, Trinidad Tobago. Um, thank you for Sharda Mahabir and also Khadija McKay for being here to talk about how we can support local action in water management and the benefits of integrated approach to water management in Trinidad Tobago. Uh, Sharda is um, very familiar with all of us here in Small Grants. She's a national coordinator for the Jeff Small Grants program in Trinidad Tobago. And she has been working um, in the Caribbean and as also working in University of Western Indies and others uh, lecturing on um, related matters. And also Khadija here is currently the program ad administrator for the Adopt a River program. And I'm sure we're going to be hearing quite a bit about how this program is working in Trinidad Tobago. So with no further ado, I'll pass on to the floor to the two ladies. Over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear us clearly. Um, happy World Water Day. Um, I, as uh, Yoko said, I'm, I am Sharda. And I am Khadija McKay. And we are here to explain to you how Jeff SGP has been supporting local action in water management in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, to best understand Jeff SGP's contribution, we must begin with understanding what the Adopt a River program is. So, Khadija? Sure. Um, the Adopt a River program is an initiative of the Water Resources Agency under the Water and Storage Authority, here towards bringing together corporate entities, community groups, and educational institutions to develop holistic, coordinated, and sustainable projects to improve the status of rivers across Trinidad and Tobago. The motto and message of the Adopt River program is our watersheds, our responsibility, our future. This is because approximately 60% of our water supply comes from our rivers, but about 63% of those rivers are polluted. The Adopt River program, therefore, is much needed to address the growing concern of poor water sources for potable water supply. The program has three main focal areas water quality monitoring and training, public education and awareness, and integrated water resources management. As champions of watershed management, the Adopt River program monitors the health of our rivers through continuous water quality assessments. The program also trains communities in water quality testing through our citizen science program, Water Warriors Training. We gift the communities testing kits for them to monitor their rivers. By doing so, the program uses hands-on education to establish and highlight the importance of rivers in the minds of our citizens. This citizen science program also builds capacity and provides avenues for personal development, especially in our young people and our women. Over the past six years, we have trained over 25 communities in water testing, as illustrated, I don't know if you'll be able to see it clearly, but as demonstrated in the map, and at least five of these are currently collecting water quality data. These communities represent the future of community water management locally. The water quality data collection is made easier through our water quality sampling app. 
This bold, innovative app allows any user to source site location, site quality, and water quality information on their mobile phones without internet, and they can access that information later using their computer. This tool has been made available on the Google Play Store since 2019. Not yet available on the Apple Store, but we're working on it. Another focal point of the Adopt River program is changing the public's perception of water. Through our public education exercises, we raise awareness of personal responsibility for the quality and the quantity of our water supply. We urge participants through our outreaches to employ sustainable water use practices and educate them on how they can take charge of water management in their homes. One tool that we use in the program to educate the public on water management issues are our EcoFact videos. These short clips produced 100% in-house serve to take pressing concerns regarding our water quality, our water supply, and condense them into fun and digestible bites. These videos are especially entertaining to our younger audiences. You can feel free to check them out on the Adopt River YouTube page. After educating the communities and training them in water quality testing, we then assist them in developing projects to improve the status of their rivers and their water supply. This is the main thrust of the, Adopt of the Adopt River program. These projects range from cleanup exercises to recycling programs, to tree planting exercises or water supply projects. So far, the program has completed over 50 cleanup exercises, 100 recycling projects in schools across the country, and at least 10 tree planting exercises across Trinidad and Tobago. We have also completed 10 rainwater harvesting systems, boosting access to water in several rural communities across the country. Hillside and riverbank stabilization projects have also been completed in collaboration with the community groups to ensure continued protection of our watersheds. The Adopt River program continues to partner with ministries, private sector entities, and other programs like Jeff SGP to successfully complete our projects, thus furthering our commitment to an integrated approach to water management. So during the period of 2016 to 2022, Jeff SGP actually supported five community organizations to work with the Adopt River program. But specifically, Jeff has to be provided the resources required to increase the community reach of the Adopt a Rivers Citizen Science Program and its app. And they supported it in specific ways by facilitating partnerships between grantees and the Adopt a River Program, by providing guidance on project development, and of course, by co financing activities to increase the community reach of the Adopt a River Program Citizen Science. Um, and it's, uh, and it's up. One of our proudest, um, uh, next, one of our proudest projects is the Cashel Gardens Community Recycling Program, which is the first of its kind for the country. This recycling program is run by women and children and has recycled plastics, glass, cans, tetra packs, and organic waste from approximately 2,000 persons. This community also benefited from the country's first solar water wind harvesting greenhouse, which was the first, uh, which was funded by Jeff SGP. But Adopt a River provided a rainwater harvester for this project, just talking about the type of collaboration that we've done. Another great example of our um, collaboration has been the Learn and Flow project done by the Caribbean Youth Environment Network that developed and executed an, a, a primary school education program in water conservation in two key watersheds, Arima in Trinidad and Courland in Tobago. Over 5,000 students benefited from the educational puppet show and it resulted in an, in, an in increase in recycling within the schools. Overall, the partnership of Jeff SGP, Adopt a River, the NGOs, private sector resulted in over 12,000 persons benefiting from public education and awareness, over 3,400 persons trained in water quality testing and recycling, um, over 50 tons of plastics and organics 
diverted from landfills and from rivers, and the distribution of eco-friendly alternatives such as reusable bottles and also reusable bags, which represented a substitution of over 50,000 plastic bags and the disposable drinking water and bottles. Now, an important thing to consider is Jeff SGP supported the behavioral change noted by the Adopter River Program. So Adopter River completed regular um, surveys of its communities and the people that they interacted with to capture the change in perception in the communities. And there was a 14% increase in persons realizing that it was their responsibility, not just the governments, to keep their environment clean and that they should recycle and reduce their illicit dumping activities in order to safeguard the rivers and their potable water supply. The partnership between NGOs, Jeff SGP, Adopt a River and private sector has been extremely important in, in realizing SDGs 4, 6, 11, 12, 14, and 17. Going forward, Jeff SGP and Adopt a River will be supporting the collection of plastics. So the, the um, distribution of uh, equipment to collect plastics on rivers to prevent marine pollution from waste plastics from, from the land. But also we will continue our partnership in the installation of rainwater harvesters to augment water supply in communities that are water strapped. And with that, we'd like to say thank you, but I close with a thank you to the previous national coordinators of the Jeff Small Grants Program. I'd like to um, acknowledge Rissa Idu and Nisha Bihari Borg, whose partnership, this initiative and collaboration would not have been realized. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharda and Khadija. Amazing combination of two of you synchronizing for this presentation was amazing. And uh, it's amazing to see the impact of this uh, Adopt the River program. I love the title of the name even, but uh, the impact of working on such a you know impressive and comprehensive way with community in different elements on integrated water management in a watershed is really commendable and uh, really amazing. And also bringing in the women and also youth to the initiative is very well taken. Um, as you know, social inclusion is a very, very important element of the Small Grants Program. And this initiative really highlights that power as well as the importance to it. So thank you so much. Now we're now moving from Trinidad Tobago to Antigua and Barbuda. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce the last speaker, Mr. Billy, Jernet. Um, he's actually uh, going to talk about the awareness raising and youth involvement in the role of actions uh, for water resources management. Uh, Billy is a founder and vice president of the West Indies Sail Heritage Foundation in Antigua Barbuda. He's been himself an automotive technician and uh, very much versed on these technologies, but also what is very important is He's been working with risk youth um, through Boy Scouts and toll ships and other initiatives. And we're really looking forward to hearing from Billy on his initiative, working with youth on water resource management. So over to you, Billy. Hello, thank you very much. Um, first and foremost, I would like to uh, uh, thank the uh, Small Grants Program and the GEF, especially uh, Ms. Natalia uh, Lawrence and Ruth Spencer, for without their help, we would not have been able to get as far as we have. Um, so I guess I'll just jump right into it. Uh, we run the West Indies Sail Heritage Foundation. Our main focus at first was on sailing and career opportunities, but we found that um, you can't sail without water. And um, when you're on the water, you can definitely see uh, the quality of the water firsthand. So we decided to put together the uh, Ocean Love No Plastic, No Waste uh, program. Next slide, please. Uh, so we are, are a registered nonprofit here in Antigua. Uh, my wife and I, we started this program uh, and we um, we try to instill a lifelong respect for the environment and uh, a sense of stewardship for, uh, for the ocean. Um, of course, uh, we have 
a lot of help from SGP and the GEF uh, Small Grants Program. Next slide, please. So our big motto is stop talking and start doing. And that was one of the things why we decided to get into the schools. And so we, one of the first things we do with our program is we actually go to the schools and we talk to the students and we challenge them to think about uh, the plastics that they have in their homes and around them in their schools and in the environment. Um, we ask them to give presentations about the four R's and to uh, basically think about um, what it is that we're using plastics for. Uh, then as part of the doing, uh, we go out and we do some beach cleans and we show them where the plastics are actually ending up at and ask them to think about where they come from and how they get there. After that, we have a, uh, a workshop where we go to a space and um, we actually make new products from plastic rubbish. So we make uh, keychains and flower pots and uh, cups and bowls. And I've been making uh, furniture as well from plastic bottle caps. Uh, then we ask the students to uh, take the Ocean Lovers Pledge, which basically says that they will do their best to uh, use the four R's in their daily life and to become advocates of change in their communities by talking to people about the four R's uh, in their homes and churches and schools. Uh, finally, we have the Ocean Love Sailing Day and we use our small vessel. Uh, you can see a picture there of one of our crew members, uh, Nevin, on one of our Ocean Love Sailing Days where we actually will go and uh, do a bit of a beach clean and talk about how the plastics were ended up on those beaches. Next slide, please. So you can see here um, some of the pictures of what we do uh, in the workspace and one of the young students with her presentation. And that's one of our plastic um, uh, bottle cover collection uh, bottles is just reusing a water bottle that won't hold water anymore. And uh, a beach clean, and then me, of course, uh, in front of uh, students at one of the schools here, Sir Novell Richards, and then some of our older students at the Antigua State College giving their presentations and their ideas on how we can reduce, reuse, refuse, and recycle plastics. Next slide, please. In the plastic workshop, um, we, we collect uh, plastics from um, around us on the island and at the local recycling center, ABREC. So we have the machines that uh, we're able to let the students enjoy a hands-on experience of actually taking what is perceived to be rubbish and turning it into treasure. So you can see here we have uh, one of the young ladies really getting into squeezing the plastic into the mold so she can make some sea creatures to take home with her. Um, yeah, next slide, please. On the Ocean Low Sailing Days, uh, we use our um, Kerikou sloop. It's uh, built in the island of Kerikou in Grenada, a wooden vessel um, that goes back to our tradition. We like to push the uh, uh, Caribbean traditions. Um, it allows us to share the thrill of sailing and gives a different perspective of the island to a lot of the students. Unfortunately, many of the youngsters that we go sailing with have never seen their island from the water. They've only seen it from the shore. So it enables them to see a different perspective and to understand, hey, you know, the water is part of their country. And then um, we teach them a bit about the effects of plastic in the ocean. We have a manta trawl so we can do uh, water sampling. We sample water for microplastics. And you can see us actually going through um, a water sample here with the youngsters, uh, seeing what we found. Uh, and obviously, uh, we found a lot of water bottle particles uh, in our plastic samples. Um, next slide, please. So here you can see the machines and the workspace that we set up. The machines are provided by a company from Austria called Plasticpreneur. Um, they're fully certified and safe for educational purposes. Uh, it's uh, 
it would be quite difficult to become injured or uh, burnt by these machines. It's really very nice. They're quite intuitive to use and they're very portable. I was able last year to take the machines to the island of uh, Barbuda and do summer camps there as well uh, to teach the youngsters in Barbuda about plastic awareness. Uh, so you see the three machines we have, the granulator, the injection molding machine, and the extruder. So what we use normally are the two machines, the granulator and the injection molding machine, uh, so that we can get everybody a chance to use the machines and to, um, to see the process. What we also tell them is that all the machines, the plans are open source. So we inform them that if they have a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit, they can get online, they can get these uh, plans and they can make these machines themselves in their communities to use for their own projects and their own entrepreneurial spirits. Um, we are located uh, in Falmouth Harbor here in Antigua and Bermuda. Next slide, please. So you can see some of the things that we make. Uh, everything that you see in the pictures here are made from bottle caps. Uh, the uh, decorative bowls and, and the cups that we make, uh, the keychains, uh, we sell those uh, to tourists a lot to help fund our program. Um, the large square one, we call that one a flower pot, but we have been surprised as to what people use them for. They use them for all sorts of things. And then one of the displays in one of the vendors that we have here. Um, all the products that we make are made from recycled plastics that we find or are given. Uh, there are no virgin plastics used in any of our programs. And our, our efforts are aimed at trying to reduce the amount of plastics going to the landfills and ending up in our oceans. Um, we plan to start uh, using more plastics in the future with a different machine that's coming to the island. So I'll be able to start going from using kilos of plastics to using tons of plastics. And we're really looking forward to that. Next slide, please. Uh, here you can see um, some of our um, people that we work with. So of course the uh, small grants program and GEF, uh, we work with ABREC and uh, MEPA, and we also work with the Environmental Awareness Group. In Barbuda, we are connected with Barbuda NGO. And we first started with Adopt a Coastline here on the island as well, where they do a lot of beach cleanups and also help to raise awareness in the communities about uh, plastic rubbish in our environments. We have chosen to concentrate on the younger generation. Um, as we all know, we were all young at one point in time, but we are now the leaders, voters, and environmentalists of our uh, own prospective country. So we think that if we want to instill any meaningful change, we should start with the younger generation so that they can help with a sense of ownership of their own country and of their own environmentalist activities. Um, our goal is to one day be in every school uh, on the island and we believe that the best actions are hands-on. Uh, going out into the communities and uh, talking with people and then doing beach cleans and um, doing the actual upcycling of plastic products. It really opens people's eyes as to uh, the possibilities uh, of reusing plastic that's deemed as rubbish. Um, that's not to say that we don't try to uh, limit the amount of plastics that are being used to begin with. So uh, our goal is twofold, first to reduce the amount of plastics and then to reuse the amount of plastics that are in our, uh, that are in our countries. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so in, uh, I would like to just uh, thank everybody for uh, letting me uh, uh, give my small presentation here. And uh, we really look forward to uh, seeing everybody in the future and to uh, keep up the good work. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's not exactly 10 minutes, but that's, uh, that's my presentation. Thank you so much, Billy. Um, this is a great presentation talking about upstream importance of reducing the plastic itself, but also, you know, taking the cleanup and also the, um, uptaking of this plastic as well and uh, bringing in a comprehensive view of how we can really mobilize youth to this place and really take ownership of their future and take care of uh, weight, water resource management in the Caribbean and particularly in Antigua Barbuda. So we really appreciate your presentation and your 
to work with the schools and youth uh, communities in the country. We've heard uh, four amazing presentation uh, today from the Caribbean, and I'm sure there is a lot of questions and comments and maybe sharing from your own country as well in terms of how you're working on water resource management and also um, water supply and sanitation issues. So uh, this is a time that now we would like everyone who have joined us today, about 50 people here, really appreciate your interest and energy and uh, bringing in your perspective. So feel free to take up uh, the space. Um, maybe the easiest is either you raise your hands up. Um, I hope you know that uh, there is a reaction button in the bottom of the Zoom that you can press. Or you can also um, mention that uh, some comments in the chat box. So um, do not feel shy and please raise your hands up and share any comments, feedback you may have. Um, Rat, if you can help Hi. me in navigating, this is great. Uh, Giles, um, hey, good morning, over to you. Uh, yes, let me let me uh, stop my video. Good morning, all, and uh, let me thank all the presenters. I the I hope the presentations. I think and a lot of lessons to be learned. Um, Bill, I have a, a question for you. The the uh, working with children on the ocean, um, taking children out. Um, there's a risk involved. Is there? How do you? Some of that risk. Do the parents sign a waiver? Is there an insurance, or is it just uh, are you persuade them to come along? That's the first question. And then, as the presenters went on, I couldn't help but thinking, how do we make these projects sustainable? They're all excellent initiatives. How do we sustain them in a project context over two years? They produce fantastic results. However, beyond two years, five years, ten years. How do we do that? What must we do? How do we upscale? How do we get the political directory hooked? I, I saw Bill uh, said, you know, we have to uh, uh, um, um, educate the youngsters. Definitely, Bill. But if there's nothing for them to manage by the time they get to 30 years, we're in trouble. So we have to make the design strategies focus on sustainability so that in three, four, five, ten 10 years' time, those resources are there. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Giles, for your great question. So first question, I think, uh, was directed to Billy regarding the waiver of the children's activities. Um, and I think the second question on sustainability, I see Sharda and uh, Khadija's hands up, so I'll direct to you. But uh, first to Billy, over to you. Yes, uh, as far as the outdoor activities with the students, uh, specifically towards the sailing, um, the parents do sign waivers, uh, giving permission to go sailing with the students. First and foremost, we ask that any student that comes on board the vessel can swim, and we have very strong safety protocols in place. My wife and I are both highly trained professional mariners, and we have taken numerous uh, safety courses uh, that are required by all professional mariners. Uh, my first goal on the vessel is to make sure that everyone is safe. My second goal is to teach. Great. Thank you so much, Billy. Um, the second question on the sustainability all of us face is that challenge on how we ensure continuity and also scaling up those, these, these initiatives in the longer term. Um, Sharda and uh, Khadija, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, actually, we, I wanted to just pipe in a little bit about the question with respect to sustainability. The adopter of a program has two mechanisms of sustainability. The first is that it was actually built into the water authority itself. So because it is part of the water authority and responsibility of the water resources agency within the authority, being the agency that manages the resource as a resource, um, because it is a part of that, an integral part of it, there's a certain amount of sustainability in that context. It, um, in terms of um, uh, uh, the uh, financial sustainability of the project, because you know most water authorities tend to be a little strapped 
um, the uh, Adopt River program also received a grant yes. from the Green Fund, um, uh, which is our new local um, green levy that is um, put against businesses, but it is a facility that is open to government entities, regional corporations, as well as NGOs, CBOs, et cetera, um, to access funding to support work like this. And the Green Fund project actually has a grant for 34.2 million TT dollars, divided by seven, so almost 5 million US. Um, they have a grant and that has also been able to um, provide them with a certain level of sustainability. Do you want to add anything? Yes, um, I would just add to that. Uh, in terms of training communities, part of why we train them is so that they can outlast us. Because we would sign, so when communities sign on with the program, they would sign an MOU for maybe a year or maybe two years, depending on the specific project that they would want to undertake. However, built into the, built into the relationship, built into the training, is that they will take, because they own it, because they recognize the importance of the work that they are doing, they will carry it on even without our intervention or without mm -hmm. our partnership. So for example, I mean, Sharda would have spoken about Cashew Gardens. Mm -hmm. That right. Cashew Gardens community, their project has gone way beyond their relationship with the Dr. River. They've owned that recycling project to, you know, to really carry it on. That is a sustainable project that we can, export the, the passion that they have for their environment, the passion that they have for the work that they're doing is what what sustains the project beyond their partnership with the Adopter of a Program. Mm -hmm. So they were able to, just quickly, um, Castle Gardens is a really good example. They were able to actually access funding on their own. So aside from the program itself, to support um, and surviving, the communities themselves having gone through the program are able to access funding on their own to support the success of their or the continuation of their initiatives in their communities sure. and expand it as well. Yes. Yeah. Wow, oh, that's a really uh, great way of in, you know incorporating the government as well as ensuring the ownership and um, continuity of the initiative by having that strong sort of yeah, ownership and and feel sort of empower the communities on their own and move forward. But one thing that uh, I was also intrigued was that behavior change matters. Um, what you know, how do you ensure that ownership and also leading towards that behavior change? And is there any like few points, uh, both Sharda and Khadija, you can share to enable? So that? we did a lot of outreaches together. Um, uh, we've done a lot of outreaches together. We go into public spaces and share the passion and the drive, but also share the information that we want to get across in a way that would be impactful to persons. So one of the things that we tell people, for example, is when you turn a tap on, you're emptying a river. So in other words, take the tap off. One of the issues that we have in Trinidad is that people waste water. It's similar to what was explained in St. Lucia. People do not um, understand that it is a, a, a limited resource. So we should try, try to translate the, the message in such a way that it would impact persons. Not only that, we took them out, the communities went out to their own rivers to take their own samples. So when they got into the river and saw how dirty and disgusting it was, and they realized that they were the people that were putting it there in first place, they had to change their behaviors because it's their space. Yes. Right. So a lot of the hands-on education. So with the war water warriors training, there's one day of theoretical training because we teach anybody from any background um, how to test waters. You don't even need a chemistry background. And um, uh, you, the first day is that visit to do that 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 water quality okay. um, uh, theory, theory. theory. But the second day is that you get into the river. You go yourself into that river. You go into your space and you take your samples, you take it back to a facility. And when you test the water quality and you see how bad it is, that's when you realize, wait, I'm doing something wrong. Yes. And right. part of, well, sorry to um, interject, but one of the things that we wanted to communicate as well, or what we try to communicate is consider the environment like your home. You don't keep your home dirty, right? You don't have stuff strewn all over your living room. And you take care of your space because that's where that's your home. That's where you reside. That's the space that you enjoy. And, and essentially what we're trying to communicate is think of your river as an extension of your home. You don't want to see it dirty. You don't want to see it looking all how, as we say in Trinidad. 
but you want it to look pristine. You want that space to reflect you as a person as well. And so when you when you think of it in that way, there's that level of ownership. It's communicating as well. Perfect. No, thank you so much. And thank you so much for that passion in really working with local communities and uh, making a change into their own space, as you say. Um, I saw Cletus, you had your hands up uh, a little while ago. Do you want to come in yes. now? Yes, just wanted to make a quick point on the sustainability issue. You know, over time, I have found that uh, most communities that I've worked with, if they have a choice of not having government involved in their projects, they will take it. Um, and so that has led me in the projects that I've designed over, over my career. When thinking through the sustainability issue is to think about how can this project be sustained without government input. That changes the dynamic almost entirely once you think, think through that, that, uh, that frame of reference. Um, there are things that government can and must do in, in most cases, but if we look past the, the government involvement and focus primarily on the community and give to the community a basis or bases for them, for them to remain connected to a project, I think we will make a, a lot more mileage that way. Thank you. Great point. No, thank you so much, uh, Cletus, for adding on those points um, in this discussion. Um, at this point, anybody else uh, for comments? And also, I see quite a number of uh, national coordinator here, too, who could maybe share your water management, water resource uh, integrated approach in in your countries, too. Um, feel free to join us. Um, Yoko, maybe I can make a point here. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I think it was must have been five years ago, the SGP introduced the landscape approach. Um, I think it was in Jeff six when it was first introduced. And that was based on the realization that our little, our little projects, let's spend time in call them our little projects, were mere small beacons of hope in watersheds. And for us to be transformative, we have to upscale and go to the landscape level. And that is where integrated planning Environmental planning in its truest and, and a truest uh, manner comes into being. How do we look at the farmers, the resource users, the communities, and the multiple urban uses associated even with small rural settlements? If we need to begin to design an approach that is continuously participatory, that is sustainable, that looks at power dynamics in all its different kinds. And, and, and that is that has a learning modality that keeps our, our communities involved and also uh, exchanging ideas. I really, really, um, when, when we started in OP6, I took on this and now I'm firmly convinced that we need to position ourselves to promote that landscape approach and to even promote SGP in giving more training to those of our colleagues who are not environmental planners or geographers or, and so on. Train in how do you use a landscape approach to integrate the planning in a very holistic and integrated way. And the point that Twitter made earlier on, when we go into a landscape, we can't go for one year and we can't go for two years. This is a five to even 10 year kind of interaction. Some of those bad land uses came from the colonial period, almost have become the DNA of the people in the way they are doing it. So you can't expect us to be transformative in two years or three years, or even in one Jeff project cycle. It may take two or even three. And that is how I think we need to approach it. You know, go from just beacons to spotlights of transformation. I think that's a point that I, I want to make and to sustain. Thanks, you. Nigel, that's a very good point. And actually it's already uh, two rounds of operational phases, about eight years that we are promoting landscape and seascape approach. And as you well articulated, 
not rather as a spot, the spot comes together um, as a small grant and has a larger impact together as a collective impact towards the landscape and seascape is where we are aiming for with multi-stakeholder sort of platform, not only just you know, civil society, local communities, but linking that with government, linking that with private sector, scaling up the initiative by having sort of a um, multi-stakeholder platform here. And in GEF8, which just started under GF, we are planning to further expand and enhance those landscape and seascape approach. And we're currently planning um, developing the strategies together so that we could initiate those further next year. and um, work build on what we have been doing for the next past eight years um, in a continuity in many ways. So yeah, great points overall. And um, I'm glad that, you know, what we heard today, we're all here, you know, hearing how this landscape approach have come to maturity. So this is wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Um, any other reflection inputs? I'd like to uh, encourage particularly um, other Caribbean countries who are here. They might have similar or a different innovation that you brought in. Um, feel free to come in. Still have more minutes. Um, and I see Leonel coming in here. So over to you, Leo. Hi, morning colleagues. Uh, thank you, Yoko. And Thank you for all the presenters, uh, really inspiring stories. One of the key things that just building on what um, Agile said, uh, in the case of Belize, what we've recognized that we can't divorce the seascape from the landscape. And so one of the key lessons that we have um, experienced here and recorded at the country level is the ability for SGP to be able to uh, really uh, demonstrate uh, the innovation, an innovation lab in the communities uh, involving civil society and government actors, which now translates to uh, leveraging of co-financing and, and other donor partners, recognizing the comparative advantages of SGP um, to operationalize the SDGs in these communities and the principles of leaving no one behind. Um, it is a remarkable testament where SGP's investment and funding always is always um, demonstrating uh, tangible solutions that are scalable in nature. So one of the key things that we've um, appreciated, at least from the various civil society actors at the country level, is they now own the process. They are now developing landscape management strategies. They are hiring landscape managers, seascape managers, adaptive program managers. Um, and so the language and the, 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 the funding, the investment is reflecting the uh, several phases of investments that SGP has made in terms of the landscape and seascape approach, which is really positive and, and really a testament of our work. Uh, and just wanted to contribute that because it is um, demonstrating really good results. Right. Thank you, Ranel. And uh, reflecting on the, particularly the importance of seascape approach. And uh, it's not only the two rounds of operation that we've been working. We've been working under the compact and other initiatives before that as well, which you were involved. In. And I think the rich experience that we have learned through these processes is really bearing fruits. And we are really committed to furthering that approach is learning from experience and also others who are doing similar approaches so that we can expand this work moving forward. Um, I see um, Platus, uh, your hands up again, and uh, we'll start to wrap up the session. Over to you. Right. Thank you very much. And I'll be very quick on this last intervention. Um, <clears throat> the, the projects we have done in St. Lucia, um, and from what I'm hearing from the presentations, um, in this in this uh, side event, they seem to suggest to me that um, that the Just Mods Grant program might give some consideration to having um, biennial or triennial uh, policy dialogues with key decision makers. Uh, when I say key decision makers, I'm talking about private sector, public sector decision makers um, to really bring them face to face with the, the policy responses 
or the policy deficiencies, you know, that are afflicting the effective management of just for small grants programs, um, whether in terms of their sustainability, in terms of their impact, in terms of their relevance, I don't know, what have you. But it's the kind of um, uh, a dialogue that I think can, first of all, help, especially the, the, the public sector um, ministers and so on, to appreciate the unique approach of the small grants uh, uh, program and the incredible impact that it is, that it is registering um, in areas where governments have not been able to, acting on their own, um, generate much interest. And that we are opening the door for governments to have a more pronounced uh, impact on, on the livelihoods of communities. I, I, and from my interaction, both from my previous job and through the, my, my involvement with the Jeff, I don't think the governments get it. Um, certainly, my government, uh, uh, well, my governments uh, don't appear to be seized of the role that um, the Just Small Grants program can play, and we are, we find ourselves waiting for policy decisions, um, sometimes far longer than the project uh, uh, life, and that has held us back quite uh, quite a bit. I think that is the case across the the, the GF landscape. Thank you. Now, very important point. Thank you, Platus, and the importance of policy dialogue and policy influence and a more proactive stance to do those activities. Um, I'll reflect on it later um, at the closing. But uh, over to you, Billy. I see your hands up, and uh, I will wrap up. Thank you. Yeah, I would. Um, th this is my favorite kicking horse is the plastics. Um, I see a lot of attention being placed on the final consumers on plastic products. And this kind of goes back towards where government can help us. We need to convince our politicians that they need to start putting their thumb on the manufacturers of these products to create a more circular plan for their products so that they have an actual end of life plan for these things so that they do not end up in the landfills and they do not end up in our oceans. If we place they just flood our markets with these products and people buy them because they're easy. I believe that we have an obligation to not only teach the consumers, but to also put pressure on the manufacturers of these items that are polluting our planet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Billy. And thank you everyone, the great participants and speakers today talking about water resource management in an integrated manner with local communities overall, particularly focusing on the uh, SIDS and Caribbean. Uh, we all know that the climate change and change in economy is really impacting the, uh, the resources and impact to the local communities, particularly in the SIDS. And we really wanted to put a shed light on the, the problems, but also the solutions that are really coming from local communities with innovation and with ownership. We heard a lot about ownership today um, by the local communities. And we also heard consistently the importance of involving youth, children, and really seeing a long-term horizon in managing these resources. Because, you know, we can't just, you know, do, do it just now for just two years, three years project, but we really have to think about the continuity. And in do doing so, what we really heard is that landscape seascape approach where we bring in all the actors and all the integrated approaches together. We can't be working in silos. We have to be working together as multi-sectoral community working on these issues. And I think that came across very strongly as well. And what we were really inspired is the innovation, I really have to say. Every community is bringing in their own sort of uh, thinking and thoughtful ideas and making into that to action. Because unless we take implementation and actions together, we cannot really make a change. And finally, also, I really think that the citizen science and also monitoring by themselves, bringing in that sort of um, technology and science which is rooted in their community is so important to advance these elements. Um, this is not coming from outside, it's coming from their own experience, own technology, and that is most feasible to the local community to advance. 
So thank you so much for this really comprehensive presentation and such an inspiring story all over. I'm really sure that these conversations from local communities, local action will be a key sort of message towards this water conference that is happening right now in New York. There is an increasing interest on this area and um, small grants program will be committed together with the Global Environmental Facility and United Nations Development Program in advancing this agenda moving forward. So with this few words, um, we'd yeah. like to wrap no, up. Today. Huh? Somebody Sorry? just we just got uh, some really exciting news that the solution youth, Giovanni Henry, was just appointed by the Secretary General to this Youth Advisory Climate Change Group. Guterres, um, just appointed, uh, I think he's the first in the solution. Uh, the, the Secretary General has put together a, a youth advisory group on climate change. His name is Giovanni Henry. He's a member of CYM and is currently working on the project with us as well. So I just thought I should say that that is exciting news for us. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, a youth ambassador and youth um, advocate um, being appointed. Congratulations to St. Lucia and uh, Really look forward to working together um, in some occasion as well. Um, again, so thank you very much, all the speakers. I really just want to thank uh, particularly all the speakers, starting from Anna Maria to um, Cletus, um, Abigail, Billy, and Sharda, and uh, Khadija, particularly for your amazing presentations. And thank you everyone for joining together. I know it's late in the night some places and early in the morning, but it has been a great dialogue. Thank you all and we'll share the slides in the recording later. So again, have a great, wonderful day, rest of the day, and uh, let's keep eye on the water conference so that we can continue to advance our local actions on the ground. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye.